lot of breaking news on this Friday, starting in Ukraine and that horrific train station attack that killed at least 50 people, including five kids. Kids who are just trying to get out of the war zone, with the U.S. calling it one more atrocity, while a Ukrainian official says this attack was deliberate. Also breaking tonight, a jury not convicting the four men accused of trying to kidnap the Michigan governor, whose office calls this now the normalization of political violence. We've got more on the reaction from her and what's next in those instances where the jury deadlocked. Plus, out in Hollywood, did you hear about this? Will Smith, we just found out, banned from the Oscars for the next decade. We'll talk about why the Academy's taken this pretty big step and acknowledging it could have handled this whole thing better. Plus, we're also learning tonight the FAA is laying out two huge fines, their biggest ever, for bad behavior from passengers. The ugly details we're getting about what they did, including biting. And we're going to introduce you to, to some so-called crypto moms who are trying to push back on this stereotype that maybe it's only men who can get involved in the Bitcoin game. They say not so fast. We'll have that later in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and we're coming on the air with new details on that deadly attack on a train station in eastern Ukraine. And it is a gut punch. Yet another glaring example of what's being done to civilians in Ukraine. Innocent people doing what they've been told and trying to leave. And it feels obvious, but we've got to say up front that what we're showing you, these pictures of war, are deeply disturbing. You can feel the sense of panic in some of these pictures taken right after the attack. Bodies lying out, luggage left on the floor. Ukrainian officials say at least 50 people have been killed, many of them at the scene. Five of them were kids. Russia denies responsibility, saying the rockets were Ukrainian. But a senior U.S. defense official says that's just not true, that these were Russian missiles fired from inside Ukraine, with the Pentagon now calling this another example of Russia's cruelty. It is, again, of a piece of the Russian brutality in the prosecution of this war uh, and, uh, and their, their, their carelessness for trying to avoid uh, civilian harm. This, you're looking at one of those rockets, by the way, and from translators at Sky News, we know the writing that you see right there says, for the children. And I don't think we can say it enough, right? This attack was on civilians. Look at this video from just yesterday at that very same train station. You can see how many people use it. It's one of the main ways that people were leaving Donetsk, which is one of those breakaway regions in the east that is very pro-Russia. Ali Aruzi is live for us in Lviv. Um, and, and Ali, we've got to be clear here. You know, who was at this train station? There had been this warning from eastern Ukrainian officials saying, if you're in this area, you've got to get out basically ASAP. It feels like that's what a lot of people were trying to do. Uh, that's exactly right, Hallie. They were trying to, the Ukrainians saying, listen, as this window is open, get out because they're going to attack the eastern part of Ukraine. And that's just what the Russians didn't want. They didn't want civilians getting out of there. And you're absolutely right. To be absolutely clear, these were all civilians there. But Zelensky said himself that there were no military personnel there. And, uh, you know, you, you encapsulated it exactly right. There's a sheer sense of panic, chaos and carnage at that train station. They launched two missiles missiles, uh, which had munitions that spread all over the place. They blow up in the middle of the air uh, and then spread in a really wide area, hitting civilians, all those bodies on, on, on the street. And they're saying this is absolutely deliberate to terrify the local population. Let's take a listen uh, to what the governor of Donetsk had to say. The enemy, taking into account its means of surveillance, clearly knew that it is a railway station, that it is a town, that there was a gathering of people. The enemy did it to prevent people from leaving the region. And, and Hallie, these are people escaping from their homes with the few belongings they can get together and run away. And this is what they have to deal with, just trying to get to safety. And then it makes their next move. You know, what, what, what is their next move? Well, that's <laughs> that's literally what I was about to ask you, right? Because what about all these other people, these civilians that are in this region that are trying to get out, perhaps even more urgently now, given this attack than they were, let's say, 24 hours ago? What, what are their options even? Well, look, they're trying to rebuild, you know, bits of that train station that are that have been uh, destroyed by this attack. They're telling them, look, get in cars, get in buses, mm. hitch a ride okay. with somebody, but just get out of this area. But of course, the trains are the safest way to get out of here. A lot, many of the roads are mined. They have Russian checkpoints and you can get a lot more people on a train than you can into a convoy of cars. So, you know, they're going to try and get the trains going again, get people in cars. But the Russians knew what they were doing. The trains get a lot of people out 
out of there and pretty safely. And, you know, we've seen people coming from other pe pe parts of eastern Ukraine. Those trains are packed to the rafters sure. with people trying to get out of these hot spots. You know, the U.S. has called this one more atrocity by Russia. And that is on top of the atrocities that we've already seen in places like Bucha. And there's this image coming out of Bucha today. Um, the head of the European Commission, and I want to show it to folks, she went to go see it for herself, and she is visibly shocked. She is visibly taken aback, right, looking at these mass graves in Bucha. She met with the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky today, too, Ali. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, her face says it all when she was looking at one of those mass graves. You know, it's not an easy thing to look at, but this has all been counterproductive uh, for Putin. You know, he didn't want uh, the, the Ukrainians to join the European Union. And when she met with Zelensky, she said they're going to fast track their membership to the European Union because of these atrocities. So everything Putin didn't want to happen is happening because of the attacks he's launching on civilians on this country. So, you know, it's all, all blown up in his face, but he's showing no signs of pushing back, of, of, of stopping these attacks. And, you know, the fear is when we hear from U.S. military officials that this is going to be a long Slug. Yeah, that's been the, the messaging coming out now over the past several days, right? The past week or so from U.S. officials. This will be protracted. Ali Aruzi and Lviv. Ali, good to have you. Thank you. We've got some developing news into us. Just in the last few hours, we found out that the jury decided not to convict the four men accused of plotting to kidnap the Michigan governor back in 2020 in what feels like a pretty shocking defeat for the government. The defendants, Adam Fox, Barry Croft, Brandon Caserta, Daniel Harris, they were all charged with kidnapping conspiracy. But the jury found Harris and Caserta not guilty. And then they deadlocked on a verdict for the alleged ringleader in this whole plot, Adam Fox. Same for Barry Croft Jr. The judge declared a, mi a mistrial for both of them. You see him on the, the left of your screen there. We're hearing now from the governor's office responding to the outcome of this, saying in a statement that Americans are living through the normalization of political violence, saying without accountability, extremists will be emboldened. Pete Williams joins me now to talk about the latest. And Pete, this was somewhat of an unexpected outcome. Yeah, totally uh, out, uh, unexpected and a big shock for the government. And really, this was the first major domestic terrorism trial that we've seen in the last several years. And, and course, to remind folks, these were men, the, the allegations were they were upset with Governor Whitmer, so upset over her COVID restrictions exactly. in, the, in the heart of the pandemic right. that they wanted to go to her vacation home and basically kidnap her. Right. So what the government says is that they didn't egg these men on, that the men already were talking about some sort of violent action against the government or perhaps the governor, that they cased out her summer home, went out there and did surveillance, that they took weapons training, that they practiced setting off explosives so that they actually were into a plot. But what the defense lawyers argued to the jury was there were 12 FBI undercovers in this, undercover agents and undercover informants, and they say they egged these men on, that the men were, in essence, hapless, high a good deal of the time on illegal drugs. It was all big talk, and they never would have done any of this, the defense lawyer said, were it not for the FBI informants. And the jury, at least in two of the cases, right. bought it. Now, I should just point out two other things. One is the government can still come back and retry the other two. So that was one of the questions. On which the jury deadlocked. Okay. And the other thing is this wasn't a total shutout for the government because two other men who were also charged in this case originally, it was originally six defendants, they pleaded guilty earlier on. You mentioned for Fox and Croft they do, they, they got a mistrial so the, the government could come back and charge yes. them again. What would be different in a, in a trial if they were to decide to pursue that again? Well, not a lot, frankly. And I think the defense would have the same arguments here. And it, whenever you wait and try again, you know, it's always a little bit harder because memories have faded a little bit. It's a little less urgent. There isn't quite the air around this that there was the first time. So it's a little more of a task for the government. Now, you know, it, it certainly raises questions about the FBI's use of informants in this case. Does it mean that they'll never do these entrapment cases or they'll never have to deal with the entrapment defense again? No. And, you know, the entrapment defense has been used in a lot of these terrorism cases, and it's very seldom successful. So that's one of the surprises here. Were you at all surprised by what we heard from Governor Whitmer's office today? Well, no. I mean, what, what her office basically says is, remember... I think the, the, the way to decode her statement is this all started with Trump is basically what she's saying here. Because remember, it was the president's criticism of her that she believed, uh, of her handling of the COVID restrictions, that she believed, in, in essence, lit the fuse ways, right? uh, that caused this, this violent rhetoric and all this violent talk about her. 
uh, in, in Michigan. But you can imagine the shock that she felt when she found out that the FBI said, you know, there were four guys that they were, wanted to kidnap you. Timeline, real quick, if there is going to be another. Because for these, and to be clear, for these two men that they're have been free. acquitted, they're done. That's they're it. walking and that's it. Right. For and these other two, right. what is the timeline for when we might hear from the government about whether they will decide to do a retrial or not? Yeah, I'm not sure whether there is a deadline. I don't okay. believe there is that the government, you know, they're, they're going to have to regroup here and say, well, you know, what went wrong? Uh, can we do anything differently the next time? And I would say within the next couple of months, they'll have a decision. Thanks for staying on top of this one, Pete Williams. Good to see you, as always. You too. Turning now to what's going on at the White House, because President Brown and Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, President Biden, I should say, and Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson today, celebrating her historic confirmation to be the Supreme Court's first ever black female justice. And you heard Judge Jackson really leaning in to embrace the moment in history that she's making, channeling Maya Angelou, laying out what this moment means to her and to the country. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. In my family, it took just one generation to go from segregation to the Supreme Court of the United States. Referring there to her parents, I want to bring in Shannon Pettypiece now, who's outside the White House. And Shannon, this is a soon-to-be Supreme Court justice who many Americans, many of us, we watched it live right here on NBC News Now, had a, had a fairly grueling confirmation process in the eyes of, of many folks. And yet here at the White House with her confirmation signed, sealed, and delivered, emotional, right, deeply personal. She was wiping away tears. She was casting this moment um, in the broader arc of history. Right, and talking about how this was not just her that got here, she was standing on the shoulders of so many before her. Yeah. It seemed like a key message she was really trying to drive home is this is not something that one person does on their own. This takes many people, not only her mentors and her friends and her family members, who she thanked extensively, but all of the people who have come before her to pave this path. So in her remarks, emphasizing the historic nature of this, the president in his remarks, emphasizing the historic nature of this, talking about the symbol that she will represent to millions of other girls out there who can now look at the court and see someone who looks like them, as well as, of course, emphasizing all of her own personal strong qualities that she's going to bring to the court. It was a celebratory moment for White House. White House officials said there was not a dry eye in the room watching these remarks. Something uh, this White House hasn't gotten to do much in the past few months is really celebrate a moment where they can see themselves putting the stamp on the country in some form. And I think, listen, it was a, it was clearly a moment for the history books, right? It was also, there was a political undertone to this. We've talked about the personal. There was a political piece to this, as you you say, with the president and the White House looking to take a victory lap, essentially, on a campaign pledge kept by President Biden. What's interesting is what we're also hearing on the Republican side from, for example, Minority Leader Mitch McConnell over in the Senate talking with Axios and refusing to even commit to a hearing for a nominee if Republicans take back the Senate, if this were to come up again in President Biden's term. Watch. We're hoping to get into the majority uh, as a result of this year's election. What I can tell you for sure, if the House and Senate are Republican next year, the president will finally be the moderate he campaigned as. Shannon, again, the political overlay to this moment of celebration at the White House. Right. And anybody who has watched Mitch McConnell in past Supreme Court uh, nomination fights, uh, they should have no doubt that he would uh, battle with all his might to stop another Biden Supreme Court nominee if Republicans do take back the Senate. Um, you know, there is no clear, obvious next uh, justice to step down or retire. Uh, of course, these the, these, you know, nominations usually aren't planned or signaled far in advance. They come, you know, few and far between. And so I think that's why you could see the president in this moment really trying to, um, you know, emphasize how he feels it will shape not just the country from a judicial point of view, but also historically and symbolically. 
Um, there, there is, and, and again, President Biden talking about how powerful it is to see somebody who reflects you, right, for, for example, young black girls across this country sitting on the Supreme Court. Let me take a bit of a turn here because there was something else that was, that was interesting here. President Biden calling out the three Republican senators who joined Democrats 24 hours ago in confirming justice, uh, excuse me, Judge Jackson, soon to be Justice Jackson. One of them is Senator Susan Collins, who tested positive for COVID, as we found out less than 24 hours ago. We know since then, a bunch of people in like Washington circles have tested positive. The House Speaker, a couple cabinet members, Raphael Warnock, the senator from Georgia, West Wing staffers, for example. And yet you had President Biden's communications director today saying it is possible that President Biden could test positive for COVID. He tested negative today, but it felt like such a notable admission from this top White House advisor. How much is the White House watching this? Like, why would Kate Bedingfield, the comms director, drop that factoid Mm. now sort of setting expectations for people that maybe the president could get COVID. Yeah. Which, by the way, Kelly, is accurate for anybody it, who doesn't hasn't had COVID yet necessarily, right? Right. Theoretically, we all could get COVID at any any moment, okay? But yesterday, the White House was uh, you know, repeatedly saying that President Biden was not considered a close contact to Nancy Pelosi, even though he hugged and kissed her on stage at two events in the 48 hours prior to her diagnosis. So the White House was very adamant. They were making no changes to any protocols and that the president was not a close contact. He would not be wearing a mask in public. There was a, I felt, <laughs> from having listened to all the comments that have been made around this, a shift in messaging with this acknowledgement that the president could get COVID, uh, almost sort of setting expectations a bit and talking about how yeah. the president is boosted. He has a vaccine. We have treatments out there. So also downplaying what that would mean if the president yeah. got COVID, that it would be different than what happened when we had a, a president uh, was two some years ago mm -hmm. now who got COVID before the vaccines. Shannon Pettypiece outside the White House. Thank you. We're going to have more on those COVID cases among these Washingtonians later in the show. And we're getting to a question a lot of people are asking, is it COVID or is it allergies? To some other breaking news now, Will Smith responding tonight, just in the last hour or so, to the Motion Picture Academy's decision to ban him from attending to the Oscars for 10 years for slapping Chris Rock. Besides the Oscars, Smith is not going to be allowed to go to any other Academy events or programs. He could still get nominated for, he could still win Oscars, though. We have the response from Smith saying, I accept and respect the Academy's decision. That's, that's the statement, that's the whole thing. In an open letter, the Academy apologized for, quote, not adequately addressing the situation in the room that night. You'll remember the Academy has said they asked Smith, Smith to leave after slapping Rock, but he refused. In the days after, you saw the Academy opening up a formal review of what happened because Smith had violated their code of conduct. The slap came after Rock made a joke about Jada Pinkett Smith, Will Smith's wife. I want to bring in Steve Patterson joining me now from L.A. to talk more about this. Okay, Steve, so a lot of developments in, like, the last three hours. This seems like a fairly significant step on the part of the Academy, banning Will Smith from the Oscars for 10 years. Will Smith accepts this. Yeah, look, 10 years is not a small amount of time. And I think it's important to say, maybe more importantly, it's a definable amount of time. I've seen experts say that if the penalty was indefinitely or something maybe even more nebulous, it gives the Academy more wiggle room to revert that decision. Where is this saying specifically 10 years truly feels more like a sentencing. So you can read into their statement. They said the Academy, you know, came to the decision out of protecting safety of the performers and guests, out of restoring the trust in the institution as a whole. Uh, but if you listen to insiders, one uh, has said a few times that the Academy was angry at Smith's conduct after the slap. You'll remember he was seen spotted dancing and joking at after parties. Uh, and the, the other counter to that uh, is that, of course, he did apologize several times and then he did step down. I think the point is this is a black mark on Smith's career. I think we can definitely say that and there's no doubt it's going to have an impact on his future. That's for sure, Hallie. We'll talk about that impact on his future because Will Smith has some projects in the works right now. We really, other than that statement that I just read a moment ago, it's not like we've heard a ton from him or his family since this all happened. No, we've we've heard barely anything. Uh, you know, obviously, Chris Rock has said several times he's not going to say anything. Right. Will Smith has issued so many statements apologizing, and then the last one just confirming that he heard what the Academy has said and he agreed with it. Uh, you know, we've heard from, uh, you know, uh, other projects that are working with Smith, just kind of a back and forth. He's got a... a, a 
project coming up with Apple, uh, which is supposed to be this period drama. We've heard there's some pullback on that. He's got one with Sony. Of course, everybody wants to see Bad Boys, the next iteration of that. We heard there's some pullback on that. Netflix has a project with him. We heard there's some pullback on that as well. So all these projects that he has as both a producer and an actor, and I think there's like a dozen or so of them, uh, you know, they're all in question in some way or form. And I think, you know, when it comes to a certain specific genre of movie, one that could be looking for an Academy Award, I don't think Will Smith is going to be the first guy that you want to have for that picture. So obviously some definite penalty uh, coming with this. I think if the question is, is Will Smith canceled? Unequivocally, the answer is no. If the question is, will this affect and impact Will Smith? Will this hit him in the pocketbook? Will this hit him at the, the box office? I think unequivocally the question, the answer to that is, is yes. And we'll just have to see moving forward whether or not how much damage control yeah. he can do on this and how much people want to take him on. Uh, after something that is now blown up this high. Super quick, Steve, just because you got your finger on the yeah. pulse there out on the West Coast. Any, like, interesting reaction just in the last hour since we've learned about this Academy decision and Will's response, Smith's response? You know, it's early. Okay. I, you know, it's early. I mean, a lot of people are popping off on Twitter. And I think if you're if you're popping off this soon, then you've yeah. got something to say that's maybe a little bit less measured than people. Sure, sure. We're, we're going to come out with actual We're full on the hot takes statements. at the moment, so all good. Yes, all exactly, right. exactly. <laughs> Steve Patterson, <laughs> worth asking. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good to see you. So not too long ago, we saw the Federal Aviation Administration proposing the biggest fines ever against two people for what they say is bad, bad behavior on a plane. And boy, we're talking big fines, heavy stuff here. One person's going to have to pay more than $81,000, the other $77,000. We saw the Transportation Secretary, Pete Buttigieg, announcing all of it today on The View. If you're on an airplane, don't be a jerk. If you don't. do it on an airplane and you endanger flight crews and fellow passengers, yeah. you will be fined by the FAA. Can we just say don't be a jerk is like fairly good advice whether you're on a plane or on every the ground. Every day, every plane, <laughs> all the time. That's Tom Costello, Please. by the way. I'm about to introduce him. <laughs> but let me just explain what one of these people was fined over. It's what happened on an American Airlines flight last year. A passenger fell into the aisle, and when the flight attendant tried to help, the passenger pushed the flight attendant tried to open the cabin door, and then after the passenger got restrained in, like, cuffs, she spit at, headbutted, bit, like, with her teeth, mm -hmm. and tried to kick the crew and other passengers. The aforementioned Tom Cassell is with me now. This is big money, but the FAA is trying to say this is a big deal. It's a big deal. By the way, both of these passengers were women. Both of these female passengers went nuts. I'm sorry, but objectively went crazy Probably on could plane. separate the gender out from like the activity went crazy. You know what I mean? yeah they went crazy on this plane eighty one thousand dollar fine on the second case seventy seven thousand dollars and this lady was biting her fellow passenger sitting next to her a complete stranger that's acting like a jerk tom i think we can say it i would yes that's I not would right that's, that's that's objective that's a state of biting somebody here's the problem it sounds like that the listen having covered a lot of these covered all the, the time. these were probably alcohol fueled i mean that's that's just kind of the sense I get, okay. but um, do I don't you know, know that. that or you just, I don't okay, know that sorry. definitively. I'm just saying I've read so many of these reports. Okay. What we do know, and this is important, is that the vast majority of the bad behavior reports over the last 15 months or so have been related to the mask mandate. Yeah. And as you know, April 18th, it's supposed to expire April 18th. I just talked to the CEO of Delta, and he said, "Yes, please." Everybody's tired of this. Really? The airline is tired of it. The flight attendants are tired of it. The passengers are tired of it. But a lot of it has been over that mask mandate. And yet, uh, we had 7,000 reports of bad behavior last year. 7,000. This year, it's dropped down 60%. Still 1,000 so far this year. And guess what the number is? I just looked it up. 70% so far this year over those bloody masks. The same argument, people still upset that they have to wear a mask on board a plane. Is the expectation from some of the folks that you talk to in the aviation industry that if this mask mandate goes away later this month, the bad behavior might go away? That's the hope. Okay. However, I, you know, I've talked to some people who fear that we've kind of crossed a threshold, not just, of course, as it relates to behavior on board planes, but just as a society. I mean, look at what Will Smith did at the Academy Awards, right? There's just this feeling that we become, we, we've lost something in terms of our decorum, in terms of how we talk and treat to, treat each other. But clearly, you know, the FAA is darn serious about this, as you heard from the Zero secretary. Zero tolerance, right? Zero tolerance. And what does that mean? $37,000 fine per offense. So not just, you know, the lady, the one of those ladies is facing $81,000. Multiple offenses there, right? And then, in addition, a prison time. 
So it, it, this racks right. up. This that your trip to Omaha right. just went from costing 200 bucks to 81 thousand dollars, or wherever this person's going. What what happens if like these particular passengers we're talking about, these women? What if they can't pay it? You know, what are the repercussions? Like, is that it? Do they go behind bars? Well, yeah, prison time is certain. Listen, it is a federal offense to interfere with a flight crew right. and to assault a flight crew, interfere with the safe performance of a plane. That's a federal offense. You go to prison, not jail, prison. So it is entirely possible if this is, in fact, if it goes all the way, they're going to have very hefty legal bills. Tom Casella, glad to have you on talking about the aviation latest. I'm Listen, passionate about this I stuff. Know, I'm so I, tired of it. You know what I mean? Just anecdotally, <laughs> I know people now, the relief is not that your flight made it on time. It's that nobody acted like a jerk exactly. on your flight. You know what I mean? Right. Anyways, Tom, thank you. All right. <laughs> Just before we came on the air, we've been following this breaking news. A D.C. judge had to hold over a bail hearing until next week for the two men arrested for allegedly impersonating federal agents after the prosecution argued for about an hour about why the defendants were such a risk to national security. Prosecutors also say that Arian Tahrizadeh and Haider Ali are a danger to the community and that Ali is a flight risk based on his Middle East travel and unproven claim that he has connections to Pakistani intelligence. A court memo filed today said the defendants have kept up their scheme for years and that Tahrizadeh, who has a criminal record, admitted to the FBI he was not a federal agent and told investigators that Ali provided the money for the free apartments that he gave to two Secret Service agents. The memo also showing dozens of photos of the weapons, clothes and other documents the defendants had stashed in some of their apartments. Joining me now is Danny Savalos. And Danny, we covered this 24 hours ago when this first emerged. This it feels like made for Hollywood movie about these alleged impersonators, right? Infiltrating in some ways, at least socially, um, some of these high profile um, federal you know, agencies here. Talk to me about what happened today and what we expect down the road. So today was a bail hearing. It happens very quickly after the arrest. And basically, the presumption under the Bail Reform Act is that someone is released uh, unless there is a risk that either they will pose a safety uh, issue to the people at large or they're going to run away. And so the government is now trying to show to overcome that, that uh, presumption of release by saying, hey, this involved guns. Uh, they're, they're a danger to the community. And they're highly likely to run because, after all, they're like the catch-me-if-you-can people. They have false IDs. Uh, they've got guns. These are exactly the kind of people that will disappear into the woods uh, because they can, because they're more than willing to make up false identities uh, because they've already done so. And that's the government's argument here for detaining them and overcoming that kind of presumption under the Bail Reform Act that defendants should generally be released. Danny Savalos, thank you so much for that quick update. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, more updates for you, including a successful launch for SpaceX and a crew of private passengers. You may be thinking, why is this big news? Why is this a big deal? We'll explain when we take you to the Kennedy Space Center next. Plus, a popular chocolate, one that you may like, recalled now because of concerns over salmonella. We've got more on that ahead in the five things. So Walmart is bumping up salaries for new truck drivers in a big way. They could be making as much as $110,000 in their first year. That's like double the average salary. Typically, long-haul truckers make about $56,000 a year. So why is Walmart raising pay? Part of it is because of the really tight labor market in this country. This big shortage of truck drivers, for example, which, of course, then has an impact on the supply chain. According to the American Trucking Association, the U.S. was short 80,000 drivers in the U.S., back last fall in October. CNBC's Melissa Repko joins me now for more on this. That's a pretty eye-popping number, right? Six figures for some of these truck drivers as Walmart is really trying to make the case like, hey, we need you, come work for us. Yes, it's a bold move. Explain more about why they're doing it. So they're doing it because these truckers are a key part of their supply chain. We've all heard the term supply chain a lot. And, and really these are the people who power both their stores and their warehouses. Over the past two years, Walmart has seen its U.S. e-commerce sales grow by 90 percent. And that means that its shelves are stripped more quickly, its warehouses are stripped more quickly, too. And these drivers are the people that make sure that everything stays in stock. I wonder what you can read into this more broadly, right, when you look at the number of job openings versus workers in this country. Because right now there's about five million more openings than there are people who are available to work for them. It, it feels like if you take it from truckers to sort of the macro scale, do workers have more of the bargaining power here? Well, we've definitely seen some unionization efforts, uh, notably at Starbucks and at Amazon. 
But in general, we're also seeing a high quit rate, even among people who are in minimum wage hourly jobs. So in January, nearly 4.3 million people quit their jobs, according to the Labor Department. That just shows the flexibility people feel like they have. If they walk out, they feel like they can find something else. Wages are up, we know that, by about 5.6% over the past year, but inflation is up even higher, close to 8% in February. So based on your reporting, what are some of the ways that companies are trying to respond to that? Is it just give people raises? Actually, raises is something that some of them are hesitant to do because that's a fixed cost that keeps going. Instead, we're seeing things like sweetening perks, like wow. offering free college tuition. That's something that Macy's has added and Target have added during the pandemic. We've also seen some flexibility. Target, for example, launched an app that allows people to sign up for hours when it fits their schedule. And then we've seen a lot of one-time bonuses. Today, for example, JetBlue announced that flight attendants can get an $1,000 bonus if they don't call off between now and the end of May. CNBC's Melissa Repko. That's super interesting. Thank you very much for being with us. Let's get you over to the five things now our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, you've got a high school football star suing California police officers after he was shot while trying to disarm a gunman at a restaurant. He says cops didn't give him a chance to drop the gun after stepping in to protect himself and everyone there. The 20-year-old also says what happened has killed his dream of playing professional football. Number two, almost a million people in Puerto Rico are without power for a second day in a row. Remember on the show yesterday, we told you about that huge blackout that forced schools and offices to shut down. Crews had been working, but apparently it's not happening fast enough because those places are closed again today. Some of the folks who live there say they're frustrated, but they're certainly not strangers to power outages ever since Hurricane Maria hit in 2017. Number three, researchers say this hurricane season might be more active than we usually see. Typically, you got about 14 named storms in an average season. Scientists are predicting at least 19 this year. Nine of them could become hurricanes. So what's to blame? A rise in sea temperatures, apparently. Number four, U.S. life expectancy dropped again. A new study shows it fell almost two years in 2020, another half year in 2021. That decline from 2020 is the biggest since World War II. And as you might imagine, as you might be thinking, the pandemic, yes, has a lot to do with those rates these last couple years. Number four, some Kinder chocolates recalled in the U.S. over salmonella concerns. Take a look at the box you're seeing, right? The company's treats basket right before Easter now being taken off shelves because they were made in a facility where salmonella was found. Listen, no reports of anybody getting sick, but just in case you got these baskets, check. The company says it's doing this out of safety. Today, a SpaceX rocket launched the first all-civilian crew for private citizens on a mission to the International Space Station. Check it out. Together, a new chapter begins. Godspeed AX-1. It's the first of its kind launch put together by Axiom Space, taking off this morning from the Kennedy Space Center. You may be thinking, wait a sec, Hal, this is not the first time an all-civilian crew went to space. You are correct. That already happened last year. But this is the first time that this group is going to the ISS, right, the International Space Station. That's what's newsy about this. You're looking at the uh, lucky four, if you want to call them that, on the rocket. Pretty big move for space tourism. But it's not cheap. Three of these guys reportedly paid $55 million for a ticket. Man, Kennedy, Carrie Sanders is at the Kennedy Space Center for us. Um, and Carrie, you know, this is, this is, it feels like the next frontier or um, the advancement of space tourism for people, let's be honest, who can afford it, right? Who can pay humongous bucks for a ticket? Yeah, $55 million. It's a tremendous amount of money. What Axiom does, though, and they say is, so they took off from over here, pad 39A. Over my right shoulder is 39B, and that's Artemis. That's a NASA rocket that's okay. on the pad there right now. The difference is, is what Axiom is doing is exploiting space. Over here, NASA is exploring space. And so... Axiom believes that by getting to the International Space Station, within about two years, they will use it sort of as a, like a construction trailer, and they will begin building out their own space station, and it'll be like a private business park where then businesses can go up there and do things in weightlessness that you just can't do on Earth, such as, and again, these are all fanciful ideas because it's still very much in the early stages, but you might be able to, they believe, 3D print a human organ that you just can't do on Earth. So 
When you talk about $55 million, a tremendous amount of money, who knows if you needed a heart and they could 3D print it, how much it would cost to them bring it down and put it in your body. But that's where they think they're going, and that's where they're going to exploit outer space on their own private space station. It's, uh, Carrie, I not only appreciate the explanation, but I appreciate you channeling your inner Price is Right uh, you know, model there with the, with the examples <laughs> that you're making. What is, it's, it's ideal, my friend. What does life look like for the, for the people that did go up to this? Because now they're going up to the ISS. You're talking about things that are years down the road. Bring it back to the next eight days for me. What does it look like for them as they're up there on the ISS? Are they interacting with, with the others who are up there? Just explain that. Well, they're, they're going up and they're, they've taken 25 experiments with them. Uh, some of them are medically related. They are going to do about 100 hours of research while they're up there for eight days on the U.S. side of the International Space Station. And, and again, I think you noted the most important thing here is that this is the first time we've seen a private industry crew not lift off, but lift off and go to the International right. Space Station. Right. Allie. Kara, if you were offered a ticket to go to space, would you take it? I would. I would absolutely go. I mean, I dream of this possibility. Um, but if I were to be a, a guessing person on when, like, the average person will be able to afford something like this, because I asked them here about this, and we talked about, you know, how in the earliest days of getting on an airplane, it was really for the very, very, very wealthy, and now most of us can do this. So I believe that maybe when your daughter, Ro, is a grandparent, that her grandchild might finally be able to afford getting on a space flight. Tim, Just a guess. Carrie Sanders with the generational think? scope. My man, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate your perspective as always. Thanks for bringing it to us from the Space Center. I appreciate it. Still to come, a big dinner turned into a string of COVID infections, a kind of COVID cluster for some of these pretty famous D.C. power players. Now, some new concerns this virus could tiptoe even closer to the president. We're going to have a look at that. Plus, you know, it's allergy season, but in the middle of a pandemic, it's kind of hard to tell why you're feeling sick, right? We're going to talk with our medical expert on how to tell the two apart next. A little bit later on, we're going to meet some moms joining the crypto craze. We'll get to that in just a second. But first, as we mentioned at the top of the show, there's a bunch of high profile folks in Washington who have just recently, over the last 24, 48 hours, announced they have tested positive for COVID, many of whom were in the same room over the weekend. The question now, what does that mean for the highest levels of the White House? President Biden with some high profile appearances this week as some high profile Washingtonians announced they've caught COVID. And now this notable acknowledgement from a top advisor to the president. There may come a time where the president tests positive for COVID. And tonight we're now learning about a cluster of cases from last Saturday's exclusive elite Gridiron Club dinner, which brings together journalists and government officials with the Gridiron Club president confirming to NBC News at least 53 attendees have tested positive since. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo has said she's positive, for example. And Attorney General Merrick Garland held a news conference with the FBI director and others before getting his positive result. Congressman Adam Schiff and Joaquin Castro also there also announcing they tested positive. Democrats looking to show life's getting back to normal, holding events, going maskless. This nomination is confirmed. As simultaneously, day after day, statement after statement comes out about cabinet members, lawmakers, and White House aides confirming they've tested positive for COVID. Doctors calling it a vivid illustration of how a return to normalcy can still come with risk. Are these anecdotal cases really showing an uptick more broadly, or is it just that we're hearing about it more because of these big names involved? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. This is uncharted territory. Our country is in a better place, 26,000 infections over a seven-day average. So it's incredibly low. That doesn't mean it's zero. Again, the point, weighing the risks, right, weighing getting back to normal. We have to note here, so far, none of the cases that we know of are serious, with most of these people saying that they're experienced mild to no symptoms here. And speaking of symptoms, I'm willing to bet that you or somebody you know has asked the following question sometime in the last couple of weeks. Am I feeling allergies or is it COVID, right? Which one here? Google searches for spring allergy symptoms are up 400% because boy, are we in it with the pollen count. Sneezing, itchy eyes, runny nose. Yes, seasonal allergies. I am a sufferer. I feel your pain. But of course, in a COVID world, 
sometimes that gives you a little bit of pause. I want to bring in our Dr. Natalie Azar. Um, Dr. Azar, I just been telling you, like, in all my group chats, this is it. Is it allergies or is it COVID? I know somebody who thought it was allergies, turned out it was COVID, you know. How can you tell the difference? Yeah. So actually, Hallie, it's easier, I think, to tell the difference between allergies and COVID than it is to tell the difference between huh. a cold or a flu and COVID. And here is why. So think about it. Allergies affect you from here to here. COVID, if it just stays an upper respiratory tract infection, it's also going to affect your eyes, your nose, your throat. So things like sore throat, runny nose, you know, fatigue, a little headache, those things are going to be experienced in either condition. The hallmark symptom of allergy though, Hallie, are those itchy watery eyes and an itchy nose. That does not happen with COVID. And on the flip side, if you start to develop fever or you get those super, super sore muscles, you know that like where, you, where you're like, I have the flu, you know that feeling, that kind of achiness and obviously loss of taste or smell, you're thinking more COVID-19. So actually for me, the litmus test is the itchiness. If you have itchiness, probably allergies. But again, because there's such a gray zone in the middle, Hallie, you know the you know what I'm going to say already. If you really can't be sure and you really can't be sure, just test to yeah. be safe, especially if you're going to be traveling or, you know, meeting up with someone whose immune system isn't quite 100 percent. Yeah, basically to err on the side of caution. Why is it that we're seeing, um, you know, every spring we deal with allergies? Is it is it worse this spring than it has been before? Or is that just like an imagined thing? Well, so first of all, the big picture is that oh, climate experts are telling us that we will anticipate allergy season starting earlier and lasting longer huh. because of warmer temperatures. When that happens, things are blooming earlier. But I basically sort of, you know, drill it down to three things. It depends on what you're allergic to. Right now we're seeing tree pollen. As the season progresses, it's gonna switch to grass and then weed. It depends on where you live. Different allergens are peaking at different times. And you know what too, Hallie? People moved and relocated during the pandemic and they may be experiencing new allergies that they never had before. And then yeah. finally, Hallie, weather plays a big, big part in this. Obviously, dry, windy weather, it's gonna, it's gonna let that pollen you know, escape and fly and get to you. Um, and on the flip side, wet weather is actually good for pollen sufferers, but it's bad because that's when mold spores, you know, kind of, kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. I was gonna I'm say, that's say a, that on here. not, um, <laughs> but so it's, it's almost like, any weather situation could theoretically um, be a problem for you. You can say that on the air, Dr. Natalie. That's totally fine. Before I let you go, Dr. Fauci has recently <laughs> said he thinks there might be an uptick in COVID cases in a few weeks based on what he's seeing overseas. He's also warning looking ahead to a fall of a potential surge. How real is that? And is there anything we should yeah. be doing now to protect ourselves? Or is it just the best practices we're all used to at this point? Well, so here's here's the thing that 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 I'm having um, a little trouble with. We are seeing cases going up, let's say, here in the Northeast in New York City. But what we're not seeing um, are hospitalizations and death rates going up. But what about everything in between? And I think that's kind of a little bit where a lot of us might be a little bit uneasy about this potential for BA2, let's say, to really extend the tail of the Omicron wave. Remember, too, that a lot of people are testing at home. So we might be actually underestimating the case counts, the case counts that are actually rising in certain places. But, you know, so a lot of philosophical sort of answers there that I embedded. But, you know, I think the end game, the end result, always that is going to matter the most is going to be hospitalizations and deaths. But we have to figure out a way to get from case counts to hospitalizations yeah. and how to really monitor what's going on in between. And that, to me, really goes back to we still don't have a really good way of measuring how effective our vaccines are until we end up in the hospital, right? Like we want to be able okay. to know, can we check a spike antibody and do we really have that correlative immunity? This was a lot that was discussed at the VRPAC meeting the other day. Got it. We're just kind of like, we're still learning as we go. Um, you know, I do think we have a lot of population immunity, a lot. I think we're at 95% between between prior infection and vaccination. That's that's good. Um, is it enough for herd immunity with this uh, stealthy virus? I don't know. But, you know, most of us will stay out of the hospital if we are vaccinated and boosted. Um, but, you know, those cases that slip through the cracks, Hallie, they'll happen. And, and people will, unfortunately, still succumb to this disease. It's just the way it is. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you so much for all that information. We appreciate it.
Still ahead, Alabama's governor signs a couple of bills restricting the rights of transgender kids. That's next in the local. Plus, the face of crypto investors is changing. After the break, we'll hear from one mom who bought into the hype, and now she's making serious bank for her family. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Southeast Bureau, Alabama Governor Kay Ivey signed a bill today that makes some transgender health care a crime. Doctors could be charged with a felony and face up to 10 years in prison if they provide gender-affirming care to kids. Ivy also signed a bill forcing transgender children to use bathrooms of the sex they were assigned at birth. From our West Coast Bureau, Oregon is suing a COVID testing company because it says the owners took millions of dollars to buy a mansion and really nice sports cars. The lawsuit also says the owners had no medical field experience. The company is now being investigated by the FBI. From our Northeast Bureau, New York is going to make it easier for blind and disabled people to vote. A settlement against the Board of Elections says the state has to come up with more electronic ways to vote for people who can't see or who have trouble reading or writing. It's supposed to be ready to go pretty soon, just in time for the June primary elections. Right now, we know that a lot of people who invest in crypto are men, but that's changing. Do you know a crypto mom? Are you a crypto mom? These are women who are investing in cryptocurrency to try to build more financial security for their families. And some of them are making big bucks. One woman, Sarah Munson, got into crypto and NFTs almost by accident. She's now meeting up with other so-called self-named crypto moms to bring more women along for the ride. She says she's doing it for the next generation. Joel and Kent has more on this. Um, it's good to see you, Joe. And let's look at the numbers here, right? 60%, like this isn't just imagined, 60% of crypto investors are men. So talk to us about what you're hearing from some of these women about why they're getting into crypto. Yeah, you know, and 60% is actually better than the year before when it was 72% men not too long ago. And so the moms that I've been speaking to, particularly Sarah Monson, say that they want to do it for the next generation. They think that the metaverse, crypto, all of this Web3 stuff is going to be the future. So they want to get in early to help that generational wealth. This is what Sarah told me the other day. It feels like we're headed in a direction where people will have more autonomy and more ownership over their life. And I think that's really important for women. Now I'm 44 and here and I'm like, oh, there's an opportunity for me to actually use my voice and my power. Now, Sarah Munson also saying, you know, I'm not quitting my day job just yet. She's in crypto because her family, uh, her in-laws got into crypto and she gave them a little money to invest. And it's now up 50 percent since she got in. So she's doing pretty well there on that front. But she says that she just wants to learn more every single day because it's a 24-7 ever-changing landscape, as I can verify for you. Because you're in it? Are you crypto? Are you a crypto mom? I am not a crypto okay, mom yet, but I will tell you, this interview <laughs> with, with, with Sarah changed the way I looked at it really? from a risk perspective. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Well, why? Because it's not for the faint of heart, Joe. I mean, that's one thing that I look at because it goes up and down and up and down. I don't know that I have the stomach for something like that, but what did, what did she tell you? What advice do, do some of these women have? Yeah, so basically she said it's important to get in and not risk too much. And the idea is, yes, Bitcoin itself, she's in Bitcoin and Ethereum. It, you know, Bitcoin's down 20% uh, right now. And so when you look at that whole picture, it does make your stomach churn a little bit. But she says because she believes that this is the future, putting in a little bit and then learning about, you know, NFTs, their value, their possible value into the future, all really matters because if that's where money and payments are going, being left behind means you're not going to make as much on the uptake and so she certainly changed my mind her enthusiasm her energy for it and the fact that you know I asked her do you know everything about the blockchain and she's like no I don't know actually at all but I'm trying to learn and as a result I'm learning as I go along so it's minimal risk at least in her bank account did these women that you talked to do they say anything about some of the criticism that these Bitcoin investors get like oh this is just a fad it's not re you know it's not so quote-unquote real yeah, you know, it's very real for Sarah Munson and for millions of other people who are already in Bitcoin. Yeah. You can see that changing state to state, Florida, New York, Wyoming, California, all getting into crypto. So when you see those state capitals and, you know, the Capitol Hill, as you well know, debating this and talking about regulation, a lot of people like Sarah say this is the real deal, Hallie. Joe Lincoln, great to see you. I'm totally fascinated to, to watch more of your reporting. Um, it's going to be on tomorrow night. Saturday, 6.30 p.m., weekend nightly news, all of that, the full story. Can't wait to watch.
Coming up after the break here on this show, Tiger Woods says he's happy with how he played at day one of the Masters. So where does he stand on day two right now? We've got a hot, fresh update for you. Straight from Augusta, next. Tiger Woods trying to fight back today. Day two of the Masters. Who started the day with four bogeys in his first five holes. Kind of a tougher slog after Woods' impressive round on Thursday when he finished just four shots off the lead. All of it, as you know, come in just 14 months after Woods nearly lost his leg in a car accident. Again, the Masters is a tournament he's won five times before. Morgan Chesky is joining us from Augusta. Okay, Morgan, lay it on us here. We don't know yet if he's made the cut or not, right? But if you were a betting man, which way does this go? Uh, I got to put my money on Tiger, right? You have to because right now he's sitting at two over, okay. uh, and that means the projected cut is currently four over. Oh. So if Tiger can hold on, he's on the 15th hole right now. He's got three holes ahead of him. Uh, barring some disastrous turnout over those three holes, it looks like he's going to have a shot to play through Sunday. Uh, obviously, it was a tale of... A front nine and a back nine today. Hallie, you mentioned those four bogeys on the front. He did stop some of the bleeding on the back nine there uh, with a series of birdies. And right now, that dropped that down. At one point, he was three over for the day. Now he's two over for the day. Obviously, this is not his round yesterday. But keep in mind that conditions uh, have changed considerably out here in Augusta. Uh, the wind in particular has picked up in a very big way. Uh, we've seen gusts anywhere from 15 to 20 miles an hour. They were anticipating 30 mile an hour gusts. And everyone in the Masters field, uh, about 91 players today, have all more or less struggled at some point during the round. Uh, but when it comes to Tiger, if he makes the cut, here's what experts have to say. Take a listen. You can never count Tiger out no matter where it is, no matter when it is, especially here at Augusta National Golf Club. He's won five times. He's more familiar with this golf course than anybody in the field. Without question, making the cut means he does have a chance. And that familiarity with uh, Augusta National uh, is something that we've been witnessing today. Obviously, he's not overpowering the course like he used to back as a younger player. Uh, he's had to be creative with some of his shots, recovering from some of those bad shots off the tee uh, or coming out of the rough. But as of right now, uh, tentatively, uh, he's in the mix for Saturday and Sunday. Right. Uh, and as you just heard there, Hallie, never count Tiger out if he's playing on the weekend. Let me get this straight, Morgan Chesky. Your gig today is to hang out at Augusta and watch golf? Okay. All right. I should no, cool. make it clear that we covered. Okay. Uh, uh, all right. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm fine saying that. Uh -huh. uh, I appreciate you are. You have done yeoman's work, my friend. Thank you. I'm glad that you're getting a chance to watch some potential history be made here. I appreciate it. Thank you, Morgan. We're out of time. That does it for this hour, but we're going to have more for you here Monday. Of course, same time, same place. I hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Coverage picks up now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.